Okay, according to my watch, it is 2 o'clock, and we do respect your time, so we want to start on time and, and finish on time as well. Um, as I said before, I am Steve Marzoff, the Integrated Services Director for VITA, and we want to do a webinar today on the recently awarded call handling equipment contracts that VITA has executed. Um, again, if you everyone would mute your phone, uh, we want to keep the line unmuted so that you can ask questions, and please feel free to interrupt me at any time you have a question as we go through the material. Um, you know, these, these webinars are for you, so if you're not getting the information you need, then ask, um, and we'll provide it uh, either today or in, in follow-up. But uh, um, uh, so, so please mute your phone, either on your phone or through the conference bridge with a star six, and um, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so getting started, today what we're going to talk about is why we did these uh, uh, call handling equipment contracts in the first place, um, how we did the solicitation, who actually was awarded contracts, what do the contracts cover, how do we recommend, recommend you utilize them, and then finally I'd like to leave uh, enough time at the end for questions. Um, you know, so why did we do these call handling equipment contracts? Well, it was something that was identified in the feasibility study that we had done in January of 2015 uh, initially that uh, suggested that, that there could be some economies of scale if we did statewide contracts. Um, we originally had planned to do them for call handling equipment, computer aid dispatch, and voice logging, and we still may look at doing some other ones uh, but frankly, one of the things we discovered uh, through the call handling equipment contracting process is unless it's something that is pretty standard, um, it's difficult to do requirements. Computer aided dispatch, because it is so varied, uh, especially among mid to larger uh, PSAPs, you know, really if we did a contract for that, it would only be for the smallest um, CAD systems for the smallest PSAPs, you know, two, three, and four position. And uh, but. The idea with the contracts was that uh, you know, we do, through the 91 Services Board, award 10 to 20 grants a year for call handling equipment. Now, 2019, the grants, or 2018, the grants that the uh, board just awarded um, last week, uh, there was only eight that were awarded, and it was about four, four and a half million dollars worth of uh, worth of grants. But in the prior year, um, I believe it was 18 grants with a total project cost of, of over five million dollars. So um, you know there are a lot of procurements going on. So we wanted to help out the PSAP community and put these out there, um, have them be statewide contracts from VITA that you could use so that you don't have to go through the entire procurement process. Um, they would be available to you to use. Now you'll hear me stress this throughout the day uh, or throughout this presentation that we are not your local procurement authority, and you will need to work with your local procurement authority to determine whether they will permit your using these VITA contracts. As I understand it from our contracts and our legal folks, we have the necessary riders uh, and, and clauses to allow them to be used by any political entity within the Commonwealth of Virginia. So we believe there should be no uh, problem with any locality, county, city, town, authority using these contracts to buy call handling equipment for, for 911. Um, however, it is ultimately a local decision whether this is the best way or the, the, the uh, appropriate way to procure call handling equipment. So um, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter that VITA says that you, can't, you should be able to. It only matters if your local procurement authority or board or county administrator or city manager uh, allows you to use these contracts. Um, they are, we, we hoped to maximize your flexibility. Uh, we'll talk about how we did that in a few minutes. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that you had choice um, throughout the Commonwealth of different vendors uh, for both purchase and maintenance and expansion and anything else, uh, but also different solutions. So it's not just one uh, solution provided by five different people. It's uh, 
four different solutions um, that you could you know, could look at. And also important is they're not mandatory. I know there was some concern when we started down this road. Would the board say you have to buy off these contracts? And the answer is no. Um, now we hope to the extent that you can get a better deal with these uh, contracts that you do. Um, but it is not beyond the realm of possibility, especially for a large piece that, that might be doing a procurement. It could be that they could even get a better deal than what we have on state contract, um, and, and that would be because these contracts are not guaranteed quantities. So the providers that, that submitted proposals don't know if they're going to sell one or they're going to sell 50, and they don't know whether there will be two position PSAPs or 100 position PSAPs. So as a result, sometimes – uh, if a very large jurisdiction who's buying 20, 30, 50 positions um, may be able to get an even better deal because they they know what it is that they're trying to um, uh, the vendor knows what they're trying to procure and can can sharpen the pencil in a competitive environment a little bit more. So uh, keep all of that in mind as you as you look at these contracts. That, you know our intention was to make it easier on the localities to, to do the procurements because we're buying so many of them each year um, and we're hoping to, to leverage the buying power of the Commonwealth uh, uh, to as we move forward. So we uh, actually had a, um, a focus group uh, that we formed of, of subject matter experts um, of, of PSAP people and we sat down with them and we went through a model uh, RFP that we had gotten and, and list of requirements uh, and, and sat down and came up with what the everything that, that a PSAP requires from a uh, call handling equipment provider. So it included, you know, the ability to one button transfer. It included uh, redundancies and, and it included service requirements and so forth and so on. Um, we then released the RFP in April of 2016 and we received 13 proposals. Now there is a requirement for state contracts that they can only be, uh, they have to be evaluated by state employees. So instead of going back to the focus group, uh, myself, Dorothy Spears Dean and, and Lisa Nicholson, along with our procurement staff, went through the proposals to determine compliance with the requirements. Um, now, of course, you know, uh, uh, we do have experience in, in the PSAP environment, so I mean, for those of you who don't know, uh, I've been in for 30 years and, and uh, managed Prince William County's 91 Center for a number of years. So um, you know, we've been there and, and, and we use that expertise in reviewing these proposals and ultimately ranked them um, uh, based on how well they met the requirements. Um, we did pricing based on a two, three, and four position PSAP. I mean, at the end of the day, there are many different flavors of PSAP configurations of call handling equipment as there are PSAPs. But we did think that for a basic, to do a basic comparison be, among the, uh, the, the, the people submitting their proposals, that we would go ahead and ask them to provide a price for a turnkey, everything you need, installation included, everything uh, two position, three position, and four position PSAP. Most of what we buy are in that range. Um, I think over 50% of the PSAPs in Virginia fall into one of those three uh, uh, sizes, either two, three, or four position um, PSAP. So the pricing um, uh, was uh, uh, was the, the main pricing or the comparison was done at that level of what the, the those uh, three different PSAPs would be. Each proposal was ranked, and based on those rankings, they decided to award to eight different contractors. Now, you may remember a minute ago I said there were four different solutions. It's four different solutions from eight different providers. Now, who was awarded the contracts, the lists here, Airbus, AT&T, and they are uh, from AT&T. You have both the Airbus solution and the West solution available. Carousel with the Airbus solution, General Dynamics with Airbus, Micro Automation with their solution, um, Motorola solutions with their solution, which uh, goes by the name Emergency Call Works, 
uh, Radio Communications of Virginia, who is um, uh, providing the Airbus solution and West Solutions, uh, Safety Solutions, uh, the former Intrado. Um, so you see here that we have five Airbus, AT&T, Carousel, General Dynamics, and Radio Communications of Virginia offering the Airbus solution and two AT&T and West that are offering the West solution. Now, we did it this way, and the reason we did all these awards is we wanted to make sure not all of these vendors will provide service everywhere in the Commonwealth. Um, so they are statewide contracts, so they can, but we wanted to make sure that every PSAP, even in the, in the most rural areas uh, of the Commonwealth, had at least two solutions providers that would offer service to them. Um, you know, two different solutions, uh, two different solution providers for Airbus, but also two different solution providers between Airbus, West, Motorola, and Microautomation. So, again, we were trying to maximize choice. Uh, and, again, at the end of these, they're not mandatory, so you, you don't have to use these um, uh, solutions. Um, where to find the contracts? If you go to our website, and this is the VITA's website, which is vita.virginia.gov, and you'll see where the green arrow is there, browse VITA contracts. If you click on that, then you will get the uh, search screen here. And if you type in the keyword in the box with the green arrow there, 911, it will bring up a list of the eight contracts that are available. If you click on one, and I, on this example, just clicked on the first one, Airbus. They're alphabetically first. You'll get this uh, statewide contract search box that comes up and tells you who the supplier is, who the sourcing specialist is. Greg Scarce, he works here at Vita um, and is available to answering questions that your local procurement person may have. Uh, the, the term of the contract, um, it is uh, – uh, uh, it is a uh, two-year contract with three one-year extensions, so we are able to extend this for a total of five years if uh, if we choose to do that. Um, and then the bottom half of the same page has links to the actual uh, exhibits of the contract. So you have um, at the top you have the what the requirements are, the pricing sheets. Um, the, the statement of work template for, for actually requesting service, um, and then so on down through. The very last one at the bottom there is the actual contract itself. And if you click on it, you'll get a PDF that is the contract, and it's 39 pages, the contract between uh, Vita and, and Airbus. Um, other documents, uh, this is uh, just a page, a random page out of, uh, the, the Exhibit A, which is the requirements. Um, down the left side are all the requirements that were identified by that group of sub subject matter experts that went into the RFP. And then you can see the second column is a yes or no, uh, whether or not that particular vendor, and again, this is Airbus's uh, Exhibit A, whether they meet that. And then you have on the far right, on the blue lettering there, you have their actual text response of what it was that they, uh, how they responded to that. Um, this is important because not all vendors agreed to do the same things. Now, yes, if, if it's an Airbus solution and you have four vendors all doing Airbus, they all met the same technical requirements as it relates to um, how the system works because it's all the exact same system. Where you will see differences is in the sections on service and maintenance, because some vendors would agree to to certain things, um, uh, certain of the channels would agree to certain um, uh, contractual stipulation or um, uh, requirements, and others would not. A simple one that that I use as an example is we had a requirement that one of the uh, uh, members of the PSAP community came up with of would the vendors be willing to get rid of the old equipment? So you're replacing a call handling system with a new one. And I got all these servers and, and workstations and things like that, and I just want them gotten rid of. So we put it in as a requirement. Um, I would say most of the vendors said, no, that's not a service we provide. But a couple of them said, yeah, we'll do that at no additional cost. You want us to get rid of your old stuff, we'll do it as part of the turnkey price. So 
if that's something that's important to you, then you'll want to look for one of those vendors that does that additional service, uh, that additional value add um, that, that meets your requirements. So you'll want to look at this Exhibit A closely um, to determine which of those requirements that we asked for in the RFP is, in fact, uh, uh, one that's important to you and, and does the vendor actually need it. And again, they should be consistent through uh, the among the the, the uh, four different solutions, um, depend, no matter which uh, channel is is selling it. But it will be different in some of those service areas and maintenance areas where it's the the work that the uh, actual channel does. And then the pricing in Exhibit B, um, as I mentioned. Uh, the price that we asked for and we did the comparison of price is a two-position, three-position, and four-position PSAP. And you'll see there, um, as an example, again, I just alphabetically did Airbus first for a two-position PSAP turnkey, $108,000, $108,500 roughly. Dollars. Um, now you'll see underneath, you know, automatic call distributing, which was an option. They said it's included, as is the RAM IS is included in that price. But if you want a mapping system, it's thirty thousand more. For a three position, it's thirty-four thousand more, and so on. And again, um, you know, we tried to set it up this way to make it as easy as possible. But then down on this exhibit B further, you'll see a list of everything else that they sell. This is all of the other equipment that could be purchased off of this contract. Um, so um, it. As you see, those descriptions there are not also uh, are not very informative, um, and the item numbers are even less so. Um, but uh, you could, if you knew the part number of what you were looking for, you could go here and look it up in the contract and determine what the price uh, would be. So what's covered? The turn key configurations, two, three, and four positions. You saw you can go straight to it. The, the contracts are intended to be catalog contracts, which means basically anything that the vendor sells for call handling equipment can be included. And we do intend to keep up with technology. So if a new version comes out or a new Neato Whizbang gadget edition, um, you know, when real-time text comes out, if there's a real-time text module, we'll add that to the contract to make sure that it keeps up with the latest and greatest that's available. But the intention was that once we selected the vendors based on the three, two, three, and four position configurations, uh, that they could provide anything uh, that's in their catalog, with the caveat that it must be part of call handling equipment. As an example, we all know Motorola sells radios as well as uh, call handling equipment. They also sell a computer-aided dispatch system. No, you cannot buy radios off of this from Motorola off of this contract. Now we do have a Motorola radio contract, um, but uh, in Vita as well. But but you would not be able to do that uh, from from this contract. It has to be call handling equipment related. Um, and uh, but you know if you wanted to buy an, an extra position, you wanted to add a position, you would be able to do that off of this this con these contract. Um, Sounds like somebody put us on hold. Please don't put us on hold because um, we get the hold music uh, if you have to step away from the desk. I realize the person who did it can't hear right now because we're on hold, but uh, um, so I apologize for that, uh, but uh, we will trudge on. Um, the terms and conditions across all the contracts were standardized. However, there are variances between the contracts because of negotiations. Um, we provided all the, the vendors our contract, and, and one or two, I understand, did very little to no change. And um, uh, those you know, reflect that. Then there were other vendors who took and asked for modifications to the terms and conditions. Uh, and, and a negotiation between our procurement staff and, and that uh, vendor took place. So you'll really want to look at the terms and conditions, and if you're con considering two different vendors, have your legal counsel review those terms and conditions to determine which may be better for you. Um, uh, you know, it, 
we, we did not agree to anything that was detrimental to the Commonwealth or we felt was detrimental to uh, the localities in these contracts. I mean, that's part of the uh, contract review process. Uh, you know, we, we, we did um, have to dig our heels in with a few of the vendors and say, this is, this is, we're not willing to offer that. This is as far as we're willing to go. Um, but uh, uh, there are differences in those terms and conditions between the contracts based on that negotiation. So, um, so be, be aware of that. And I mentioned before, not all the vendors provide statewide service. Um, we may go ahead out and talk to them and see if they're willing to give us what their area is, but it may vary, uh, you know, based on the work that they get. They, you know, uh, if, if a vendor's a little hungrier, they may be willing to go a little further out. And, and we don't want to hinder their ability to do statewide if they choose to. But ultimately, it is the choice of the vendor. So do not be surprised if you contact a particular vendor um, uh, and, and ask them if they want to, would be willing to, to do your project or to submit a proposal or something like that. And the vendor says, no, I'm sorry, we don't serve that area. They are statewide contracts, but they are not required to serve statewide. So those are generally the contracts, how they were constructed, and and um, you know where uh, where we see the, the the value of them. Now here's how we recommend you use them, because at the end of the day these are here for you, but they are just a tool, and you can use them in a number of, of ways. Um, there, there is nothing wrong with they are state contracts. There is nothing wrong with you picking a uh, a vendor from it pointing to the turnkey three-position piece out of saying, I want that, and placing an order. And you could do that, again, subject to your local procurement and your local uh, legal review process. But what we'd recommend is you take a, a little bit more time and uh, with, with reviewing those proposals and with reviewing the vendors. As I mentioned before, review the requirements and the responses. That's that Appendix A. Go line by line. Understand what it is that they're saying they will do and what they will not do. Don't just don't assume that just because um, this particular call handling equipment has a national reputation or or uh, uh, or has a has a contract with Vita that they're going to deliver to you exactly what you need. It is really on uh, uh, up to you to put together some subject matter experts to sit down and go through those. Section A of, of the proposal, understand what the um, uh, what the services are going to be provided from that particular vendor are. And again, they vary. Even if it's two uh, Airbus uh, solutions provider, two West uh, solutions providers, they may have different services that they're offering. So so look at that and figure out which one best meets your need. Now, after you do that, you may be down to one or you may still be at two that would meet your requirements that you want to consider. So also look at the terms and conditions. That was typically going to be your legal staff would need to review that, your county attorney, city attorney, um, you know, uh, person who watches Perry Mason a lot, somebody, whoever that you trust to, to understand terms and conditions and compare them between the two documents, between the, the vendors that you're looking at to determine which ones best meet your needs. Um, you know, one may have a, a better uh, liability protection for the locality than another one. Um, you know, take a look at those and understand what it is that is in those terms and conditions. Compare the price balanced with the requirements. In other words, some of those vendors, like I said, offer additional service, well, it might be an additional cost. So just because it costs more doesn't mean you're not getting more. So look at that. Look at the number of your requirements that are met by contractor A or vendor A versus vendor B. Um, a may be a little bit more money, but if they actually deliver what it is you need and, and meets more of your requirements, it may be beneficial for you to uh, go ahead and, and contract with that vendor for that service. Um, and don't be afraid to negotiate with one or more vendors uh, on, on you know, options because, you know, again, these are basic turnkey call handling equipment. 
uh, configurations for the two, three, and four position. You may want to have uh, some options in there, like mapping or, or other things that uh, that you have a configuration with your radio consoles or headset management or things like that. You can negotiate. Uh, one of the things my uh, uh, procurement staff is always reminding me is the contract sets the maximum price. You can always negotiate for better. Um, so if, if you desire to do that and you want to do that, again, it all takes time. It takes effort, but it might be worth it. But ultimately, one of the biggest messages here today is be sure you understand what you're buying. Now, I am confident that all four of the systems that we have on contract meet the requirements that we put forward, or we wouldn't have a contract with these uh, entities, uh, with these vendors. But the service levels are different. Uh, the, the solutions are different. Some might meet your PSAP's particular needs better than others. So, so make sure you understand. Ask questions. There's nothing that says that you can't call any of these vendors and ask them to come into your locality and make a presentation. You don't need to tell them, hey, I'm meeting with three of you or I'm only meeting with you. You can use these contracts and the vendors and, and I don't say against each other, but, but leveraging them so that you get the best deal possible and that you understand what it is you're getting and what your requirements are. I mean, at the end of the day, then you just select the best vendor. All you need to do is is a local purchase order. You can reference our contract numbers. They were on that uh, uh, web page that I showed you, the, the Vita Procurement web page. Uh, you can reference that, uh, that uh, contract and move forward with your procurement. Now, if you're a larger center, we did focus on two, three, and four position because that is, is – uh, the, the configuration that is most common within the Commonwealth. But above four position, we have all sorts of configuration. There's five, ten, I mean, I think Fairfax is 74 positions. Um, so we wanted to have an ability to use these contracts for larger PSAPs. Um, but also for upgrades, you want to expand, add two positions. You want to add uh, a supervisor position. You want to do whatever. Um, so Again, these are contract or catalog contracts. So anything that those vendors sell uh, for Airbus call handling equipment, West micro automation, or uh, emergency call works Motorola, you can procure through these. So if you are need one of those, again, I would review the requirements uh, and the responses that that section A of the uh, or exhibit a that's a part of each one of the contracts and review the terms and conditions again by with your subject matter experts and your legal staff respectively that's going to tell you is this the vendor that i want to move forward with and and talk to about um, looking at our solution here and then i would select from that you know again there's eight to choose from considering the ones that are willing to work in your area um, i would select one or more and ask them to develop a proposal. Now, I would review that proposal against the contract pricing. Uh, I mean, you can you can look at the two, three, and four position and the uh, piecemeal pricing that's uh, listed in the catalogs, and come up with some idea of whether that proposal is is a good proposal. Um, but then you can choose to negotiate further with them. Um, you know, if I'm buying a 20 position piece, that I might expect a little greater discount. And uh, and and again, you're using the contract, but you can always negotiate for the best pricing possible uh, from that particular vendor on those larger three uh, or larger four and or five and above position piece apps. So um, there's nothing wrong with with doing that with the vendor. Now they may say, no, I'm sorry, that's the best price that we can give which is the price that's uh, available on the contract. And that's fine too. We're hopeful that most of them sharpen their pencils very, very well in preparation for this uh, RFP and, and their responses to it. But you know, there might be circumstances where 
again, depending on what you're buying, how much of it you're buying, you might be in a position to be able to get even larger discounts, especially for those larger systems that might be purchased. I will repeat again, though, be sure you understand what you're buying and make sure that you've, especially for those ones that aren't part of the turnkey configurations that uh, we've outlined in the, with the requirements in, in the RFP, um, you know, make sure you understand, okay, who's providing the, the, the cabling? Who's providing, who's, is somebody going to test the cabling that exists to make sure it's adequate? What about uh, uh, grounding? Is, is somebody going to do a grounding survey? Is the vendor going to haul away the old equipment? Are they going to get rid of the boxes that everything came in? Just make sure that you understand the roles and responsibilities that you have and that the vendor has going into it because um, that will avoid surprises later and disappointment when, you know, you say, well, why didn't you do this? And they say, oh, well, that wasn't part of the contract. Um, so, uh, again, it's, it's, it's the onus is on you to understand what all is included. I think we put together a pretty good RFP and a pretty good contract, especially for the two, three, and four position PSAPs but we may have missed something. So make sure that you, know, you understand each step of the process um, in moving forward. Um, and then again, you, know, you select the, the, the best uh, solution for, for, your, um, for your PSAP, what vendor is best going to meet your needs. And again, it may not be the lowest bid uh, or lowest cost proposal because some vendors are willing to do more than others when it comes to service and maintenance. So that's an overview of them. They're on our website now. Uh, you're free to use them anytime. Um, we can, your regional coordinators, or I, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I know that um, we haven't done a whole lot of contracts for 911 equipment before within VITA, but VITA has dozens of contracts that are used by localities every day. Um, probably the biggest ones are, are telecommunications contracts uh, for T1s and PRIs and things like that. So we, we do have a lot of, uh, of contracts that local procurement uh, officials use all the time so that um, your, your local procurement folks probably are used to using VITA contracts, um, so you know, I would encourage you to get involved with them. And, and I told you, you're going to hear me say it several times, that ultimately it is a local procurement decision whether to use these contracts or not to use these contracts, and it's a local procurement decision whether you can even use them. Um, some localities still want to go out to bid uh, on their own for certain services and, and products, regardless of whether there is a, uh, a statewide contract, much the way VITA will do that instead of using a GSA contract sometimes because it's in the best interest of the Commonwealth, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there w there's no problem with a locality that wants to uh, do their own procurement and, and not use these contracts, but it is a tool that's available to you. Uh, there is hopefully enough selection there with eight different vendors to choose from and four different solutions. Um, but you know, please give us feedback. If, if, you're, if one of the vendors isn't performing well, if one of the vendors uh, isn't responsive to your inquiries, you know, let us know. That will impact whether or not we renew with that vendor at the end of the contract period um, and, and whether we do the you know, one-year extensions with them. So with that, is there anything I didn't cover that you wanted to know more about or any questions that you have? And remember, you have to unmute your phone. Oh, come on. Somebody's got to have something. This is all brand new stuff, so you got to somebody's got to have a question. And if you're thinking it, you know half a dozen other people are and they're just hesitant to, to ask. So Steve, this is Jim Junkins. Hey, Jim. I, I I will say I don't have a question, but I do have a comment, if that's okay. Please. I want to thank the VITA staff for taking the effort to do this. I think it's going to be an immense help for the PSAPs. Um, 
um, large and small um, to, to to make a, make the effort easy. This has been a challenge for for us, and I don't think that the we feel that it's it's been an inconsistent thing, but it's it's just the nature of the beast. And this this is a certainly great help. So I want to thank you all for doing your work. You're you're welcome, Jim. I, it, it was a considerable amount of work, not just by Vita staff, but also that group of subject matter experts. They met you know, half a dozen times to go through uh, the, those requirements and. And, and, you know, the reason we did it, and I, and I want to make sure this is clear, is the feasibility study, while well, I referenced the feasibility study, the feasibility study was really a reflection of what the stakeholder community had been saying, was saying. So it was the stakeholder, it was all of you that said, hey, these would really be helpful. It took longer than I would have liked. <laughs> it took us over a year to, to, or to get this done from the feasibility study time, but it, it was, um, uh, it was worth it. I, 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 I'm hoping it was worth it, and we'll see. The you know, as you as you use these, you know, again, drop us a note and let us know what your experience is with them, and whether you found a hole in the contract. So we can always do contract mods. If there's something that we missed that should be there to protect other PSAPs, um, let us know. We, you know, we we are going to manage these contracts, not just do them and and walk away from them. That's part of the the service that Vita offers. So thank you for your. Uh, comments, Jim, and, and, you know, if there's more we can do, let us know. And, and I will say, too, you know, if you have feedback on what we should do next, whether we should do try and do CAD or whether we should try and do uh, voice logging or um, those sorts of things. Now, we are going to move forward with an ESINET one for Next Generation 911 for ESINET and core services, um, but uh, – you know, whether if you think there's other areas where we can help with statewide contracts, let us know as well. Any other comments or questions? Steve, I still see some questions, Johnny. Yes, sir. Um, I've already gotten started getting calls from vendors about the contracts, and most of them is our contract is different than their contract. Can you recommend any easy way to figure out what the differences are in these awards, or were they all under one standard package? Do you mean the differences among the, the, the eight different contracts? Um, yeah, just for example, like Airbus, I've had a couple vendors say, well, my price includes this, but their price, you know, this one doesn't include this. So, I mean, I'm guessing they all went off a base package. Yeah, they, they all went off the base set of requirements that we had identified in the RFP. Some of those, um, some some people took exception to some of those requirements. Like, you know, you saw one there that in that example that I brought up where where Airbus said no. Um, now I think that one was specific to the equipment, so I'm sure all the Airbuses said no to that. But um, if it was one of the service areas, uh, you know, uh, Carousel or uh, General Dynamics or Radio Communications of Virginia might have said, yeah, we'll do that. Um, so that's where some of that difference is. It would be identified in there. I don't know of an easy way. Uh, okay. We didn't do any kind of cross-tabulation of responses to say, well, Airbus agrees to do this, but, um, you know, this other group does not. Um, I, I don't think we have anything like that that, that does it in an easy way. It's, it's just mainly that um, Exhibit A uh, on the contract that, that lays out what what uh, one vendor decides to do. And if you have one vendor who's saying, we do it and they don't, I would look at that other vendor's Exhibit A to see if that is – it is based on the contract because that's where it would be defined whether that vendor does that or not. Okay. That was just – Trying to look for uh, it's already beginning. So, <laughs> well, and I'm certain that the, um, the 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 eight localities that are going to receive funding in 18, and the 18 localities that receive funding in, for 17, if you haven't moved forward yet, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those vendors start reaching out and courting you because they know you they know you have a project because you receive grant funding for it. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know that that's a bad thing, but you know, to the extent that uh, you want to talk with them, I, you know, I think that's a, uh, it's as good a starting point as any. Oh yeah, I've got fifty percent. I've got four out of eight of calls so far. <laughs> so that wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Keep in, I'll... Too, keep in mind too that uh, again, under that notion, this is a catalog contract and covers the installation and service. 
is you can also use these vendors for service. So if I've heard um, some localities complain about their current service provider and, and it may be somebody who's not on contract now or somebody who, who's getting out of the business, uh, um, uh, I mean, I think, I think it still stands that Verizon is getting out of the, the uh, call handling equipment maintenance by the end of this year, by December 17. And uh, uh, if, if your contract is, is needs to, you know, you need somebody to maintain your equipment, you can feel free to reach out to these companies just for a maintenance uh, quote and say, hey, we're looking at somebody to maintain our system under this contract. Um, you can do that. It's not just the, the purchase. It's also the options that come with it, which includes maintenance. So, uh, in fact, I think for the two, three, and four position, the prices are laid out in the contract uh, for what maintenance, annual maintenance is uh, from the different vendors. So you can look at that and figure out, and again, look at the Exhibit A to determine any differences in response time because some um, – I think we had a four-hour response time, on-site response time requirement in there, and some of the vendors said, no, I, I'll promise within four hours to to respond, but not necessarily on-site. It might be remote or, or this or that. So that's a section to pay particular attention to because some of the vendors said, you know, there's a big difference between having a body at your site and having somebody on the phone. And depending on what your requirements are and what it is you're willing to pay for, you may want to um, to look at that and, and see the differences between response time of different maintenance vendors, um, you know, that, that you have. Again, if your maintenance contract is coming up for uh, renewal or uh, expiring or that sort of thing, there's, you can do that as well. Other questions? Yes, Steve. This is Bobby Wingfield. Hey, Bobby. Um, is there a place that, like you got your 18 localities, I think that's, maybe looking at the state contracts, is there a way to see what localities accepted which vendor? Like five may pick uh, radio communications and five may pick um, Curacao, but nobody else picked anyone else. Is there something with that to gauge the uh, acceptance? Yeah, we haven't uh, thought about that. I mean, we, we probably can. Uh, the vendors are required to report to VITA, uh, the, the the business that they get um, so as, as part of their um, uh, contract management um, efforts. So what we can uh, we might be able to do that and see you know, who's using who. But I don't know that I would want that to drive your selection. Uh, just because it was a right fit for five other localities may not make it a right fit for you. So we want to make sure everybody exercises their their due diligence in determining who best meets is the best deal for, for that locality. I, I truly believe any one of the vendors that are on contract can do the job for you um, and do it very well. I mean, the, the four solutions that are on there, um, you know, were impressive um, uh, in, in their meeting of our requirements. But just because they're on contract doesn't mean they're the best fit for you. And, uh, um but we probably can do some reporting on that and, and you know, with with because we also track as our locality profile who does who did the installation or who what system they have and, and who does maintenance for it. Um, but uh, we'll look into that some more and see if it's something we can do. Okay. Because I was just looking at the price of them, too, because, like I say, the price can always come down. It can't go up. So I'm just looking at who's, who's more negotiable than others are. Yeah, it was interesting to us, uh, the, the, you know, when you do have uh, two vendors doing w the West system and five, four vendors doing the uh, uh, Airbus system, it was interesting to see the price differences. <laughs> you, you wouldn't think there'd be that big a price difference for when you're bidding the same exact system, but there there are differences. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, Steve, this is Stephanie McGuffin. Um, I'll make a, a statement about the contract, and then you can uh, confirm or deny it. But under the authorized users, it, it includes all public bodies um, and even some uh, private institutions of higher education. So that would mean that um, secondary PSAPs or campus um, 911 centers that use uh, call handling equipment would also be able to use this contract. Is that right? That That's correct. 
It's any political entity of the, the Commonwealth. So they, it doesn't have to just be the grant recipients. It's, this is a VITA contract, not a board contract. So it's not just the locality or the entities that the board works with on a routine basis, the 119 primary wireless PSAPs. It is a VITA contract that any university, local government, authority, um, uh, you know, any quasi, anybody who's authorized to buy on VITA contracts can buy off this. To my understanding, subject to local, their local procurement and legal review and acceptance. It is also possible, keep in mind, uh, one other thing I'll mention is one reason I've heard some localities don't use VITA contracts or statewide contracts or GSA contracts is the terms and conditions. So don't be surprised if your local legal or procurement uh, official reviews the contract and says, I don't like these terms and conditions, even if it is the best price. Um, you know, when when you're talking about things like liability protection or or um, uh, uh, outage protections or, or service level agreements or things like that, uh, sometimes uh, local entities or, or an individual entity, they have to be local entity, will want to write their own terms and conditions. Um, so, you know, that's something to consider as well as you move forward. You know, are the terms and conditions that Greg was able to negotiate, and again, Greg Scarce is our, and his name's on all the contracts as our procurement um, rep uh, representative. He's the person to direct those types of questions to if your local procurement or legal folks have any questions. Um, but you know, he negotiated the best contract that he could for the Commonwealth as a whole. It may not be what your local procurement or legal folks would otherwise agree to. And again, give us that feedback if that's the case so we know for next time. Any other questions or comments? Going once. Going twice. All right, well, if you do come up with any oh. questions, please feel free to send me an email. Send an email to your regional coordinator. Give us a call. Uh, you can call Greg for directly for question procurement related questions about the contracts themselves, or especially if, if your local procurement folk wants to talk to a state procurement folk and and you know kind of talk that that uh, that that language that only they can talk. Um, but uh, you know we hope that these are usable for you. If not, please let us know why so that we can fix it. Um, and uh, if there's nothing else, everybody have a great day, and thank you so much for participating. And uh, as always, if there's anything that we can do to help you do your job better, let us know, and we'll uh, do it. We do have a, uh, a couple other webinars coming up on the email, reminder email that went out yesterday. There's uh, – uh, and I hope Melissa Parsons is still on the phone. It's on February – help me, Melissa. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. February, what date is uh, the Wendy's uh, presentation on uh, the uh, DBMP imagery? February the 8th. February the 8th at yes, 2 o'clock. We'll be doing a uh, webinar on uh, – she'll be doing a webinar where she's going to be showing the uh, imagery review tool that Fugro, who's our new vendor for imagery this year or this cycle, uh, will be demonstrating uh, that tool, uh, the imagery reviewer. So, um, you know, that may if, if you're if you're not interested in that because you're more PSAP focused, you know, let your GIS uh, people know uh, because uh, we we really want to utilize that tool for review of the imagery as it's being delivered and so on. So, if there's nothing else, you all have a great day and uh, hope to see you or hear you on another webinar in the future. Take care.